Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers, Sunil in particular, for uh, the invitation to speak at this, uh, at this uh, symposium. Uh, as all of you know, Aditi did uh, very important work in the, in the field of active matter. So I thought it uh, would be appropriate for me to talk about some work that uh, we have been doing in, the, in that area in the last few years. Uh, in particular, today I want to talk about, um, you know, as it as says here, persistent active matter. I'm sure all of you are now familiar with active matter. These are dealing with basically uh, <coughs> objects uh, that can convert uh, uh, stored or ambient energy into systematic motion. Uh, most of the examples come from uh, biology, in particular living matter, uh, bacteria, school of fish, a flock of birds, etc. These are good examples of uh, uh, collective phenomena uh, in active systems. And these days, um, uh, there is also a lot of work on uh, what is known as synthetic active matter. And genus colloids, or um, Rajesh will be talking about, I suppose, uh, vibrating granular stuff or something else. Uh, <coughs> so, I mean, lots of experiments on synthetic active matter also. And the reason that a uh, lot of work is going on uh, in this field is that. Uh, Many of these uh, systems exhibit uh, very interesting non-equilibrium collective behavior. I emphasize non-equilibrium because uh, these systems are explicitly out of equilibrium because of this, that there is um, uh, energy input and uh, dissipation, so strictly out of equilibrium. <coughs> uh, in the talk today, I'll be uh, mostly interested in uh, the properties of dense systems of active matter. And in this context, uh, the physics of uh, glasses or glassy dynamics or jamming, uh, they will become relevant in, the, in this particular context. Uh, in particular, uh, today I'll be talking about a thermal active matter where thermal fluctuations are not there. So there, the sort of paradigmatic uh, uh, phenomenon that people discuss uh, in the context of dense a thermal matter is uh, the phenomenon of jamming. And uh, I just wanted to show one or two slides because uh, later on we'll be talking about uh, jamming in uh, our active matter systems. So here, uh, as I said, I mean, one is looking at uh, 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 systems where the thermal fluctuations do not play any important role. So I mean, uh, in a model sense, one can uh, put the temperature to be equal to zero. And then uh, one looks at uh, uh, basically how a collection of uh, uh, hard objects behave uh, it's a function of uh, the density. So one starts at low density where, uh, let's say, this, uh, uh, these particles can sort of move around in this, in this box. But then as one goes to high, higher and higher densities by compressing the, the, this box, beyond a point, the objects basically lose uh, their ability to move around. And so one is going from some kind of a fluid-like state to a jammed state. And this is the phenomenon that we'll be talking about as a function of uh, basically the density or the packing fraction. And here, there's a, there's a diagram which says that as you go to in this direction, uh, uh, where the, you're decreasing density, this is one over density, so decreasing density, then uh, you have loose grains, uh, as, we have, as we have shown here. But as one goes like that, uh, increasing the density, then one has a jammed system. And we'd be interested in various properties of this jammed system, as well as the process of going from here to there, the fluid-like state to the, to the jammed state. And uh, one of the reasons why one is interested in this is that uh, this phenomenon uh, of jamming and related stuff has been studied in great detail in the context of, uh, uh, you know, context of uh, uh, systems that are not active, passive systems. And uh, in particular, one finds uh, very interesting behavior uh, near the point where the system goes from this uh, kind of fluid-like state to the jam state, near the threshold. And one sees various kind of uh, uh, power law behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And I just uh, give you some examples of uh, those here. Uh, <coughs> at the thresh jamming threshold, one can show that the average number of neighbors that each of these objects, each of these particles um, has, is uh, two times the spatial dimension. So in two dimensions, uh, at the jamming threshold, on the average, each particle will have four contacts, four neighbors. Now, as one goes away from the threshold, phi is the phi c is the threshold uh, at which jamming occurs, and as one is going to values of phi, which is slightly above, then this uh, number of contacts basically has this power law dependence on this uh, phi minus phi c, for example. Uh, in, in the jam state, when one is very close to the jamming threshold, uh, if I look at the distribution of uh, the contact forces, 
then that itself exhibits a power law. Uh, and uh, you know, so the, the, this, sort of, this sort of behavior, I mean, power laws are, are, are in some sense uh, signatures of some you know, phase transition or some kind of uh, uh, <coughs> marginal stability and so on and so forth. So people have uh, spent a lot of time trying to sort of understand this kind of behavior in passive jammed systems. One of the things that uh, we'd be interested in is uh, whether, uh, if you look at a jamming of active particles, whether some of this phenomenology uh, is changed or not. So that's the basic, basic idea. <coughs> the motivation for uh, looking at this uh, basically comes from, again, as usual, from experiments. Uh, these days, there are a very large number of experiments on biological systems uh, which are showing behavior similar to this transition between a fluid state and the jam state. Uh, and I've just given you some examples here. Uh, <coughs> and as I said, you know, there is also um, a lot of experiments on artificial active matter. Uh, there also people are interested in this behavior uh, of you know, going from a fluid-like state to a jam state as uh, you change the density or uh, some other parameter in the system. Want to show you just one or two examples of such uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so here one is looking at uh, <coughs> jamming during uh, cellular motion. And uh, if uh, the, so this is just a movie which shows that one starts with a, a fluid-like system where things are moving around. And eventually, as time progresses, one gets into a jam state where things stop moving. Uh, as you can see here, it's taking place over some 70 hours or whatever. Uh, and this transition from fluid to jam state as uh, one goes to longer times. And one can show that this transition is driven by increase in the interaction between cells. Uh, <coughs> so again, you know, cells are uh, active uh, uh, systems in the sense that you know, uh, they have this the ability to move and, and so on and so forth. So this is a jamming transition uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a system, in an active system. Uh, and uh, as some parameter is changing then one is going from a fluid-like state to a uh, solid-like jam state. Many such experiments, and uh, here I show uh, a recent uh, paper where the, uh, the claim is that there is a jamming transition in uh, uh, the proliferation of cancer cells. So basically, uh, as you know, I mean, you know, there is something called metastasis in cancer where the malignant cells uh, go from one tumor to the rest of the body. And uh, the claim here, at least, is that uh, here, for example, this is the tumor where the, the cells are basically inside the tumor with a jam state. But then one from here to there, the cells are basically uh, going away from the tumor. And one is going from a jam state to a fluid state, uh, as again, some parameters are changed. So again, you know, I, I don't want to go into too many details. But uh, basically, there are these experiments which show that uh, even in active matter, dense active matter, uh, there is this transition from uh, jam state to a fluid state as appropriate parameters are changed. And this is something that we would like to study. <coughs> so <coughs> we'll start with, uh, of course, I mean, you know, these biological systems are quite, quite complex. And one uh, uh, would eventually like to model them in their complexity. But uh, uh, at this point, we are starting with very simple models, particle models and trying to understand uh, uh, putting in activity and then trying to understand how activity modifies the jamming behavior in such systems. <coughs> so this is a cartoon of such a system uh, where I have drawn two kinds of uh, particles, uh, different colors. And uh, they represent basically well similar particles, but the interactions are a little different. So why do we consider a mixture of two different kinds? It's because if we had a single kind of particles, and if the interactions are simple, then typically such systems, in, if you make them dense, they go into a crystalline state. Whereas, of course, this jam state that we are looking at uh, is not a crystalline state. It is an amorphous state. So to get uh, amorphous state in the high density limit, uh, typically, you know, in a model sense, people consider these binary mixtures, where we have two different kinds of particles. And the interactions, are A, 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 B, and uh, B, B interactions are different. And uh, if one chooses those interactions appropriately, then one system doesn't crystallize. And one basically ends up into a amorphous state. And this has been done, you know, this kind of systems have been studied in uh, great detail uh, in uh, non active systems uh, to study glass transition and things like that. <coughs> so we'll be looking at similar models and uh, <coughs> uh, we'll modify these models by putting in active forces. 
and this arrows that I am uh, shown here, this in indicate active forces. And these forces will be characterized by two parameters. One is basically the strength of these forces, uh, and uh, the other is basically uh, what is known as the persistence time. So this active force itself uh, doesn't maintain its direction. It, it, it fluctuates uh, in direction. So there is a characteristic time scale associated with those fluctuations, and that is called a persistence time. So if you have a long persistence time, that basically means that the force retains in direc its direction over a long period of time. If the persistence time is very short. That basically means that it fluctuates quite, quite uh, quickly and forgets about its original direction quite quickly. And in uh, the, the, the talk, the remaining part of my talk, I'll be talking about uh, limits where this persistence time is very long. That's why I call uh, the systems that we look at uh, persistent active matter, where the direction of this active force does not change uh, uh, over a short period of time. <coughs> so now, uh, basically, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the models that we have looked at and what kind of results we get from uh, our studies. So here, as I said, we'll be looking at uh, so what we call extreme act active matter is where the persistence time is quite long. And also, the active force will not be uh, very small. It will be uh, comparable to interparticle forces. So that is what we call extreme active matter. And again, as, as I told you, we have looked at a mixture of particles in two dimensions and uh, simple interactions. But uh, the interaction parameters are chosen in such a way that uh, this system does not uh, go into an ordered crystalline state, even at high densities. Uh, so <coughs> one can study, basically, uh, this kind of jamming or glass transition behavior in such systems. Uh, we'll uh, look at ethermal dynamics in the sense that we uh, don't look at uh, thermal fluctuations, a uh, situation where the thermal fluctuations don't play any important role. And, uh, but we will look at self-propulsion force of magnitude some f uh, <coughs> acting along different directions. So the equations that uh, each particle obey, the equation of motion for each particle is something like this, where it's just basically uh, writing Newton's equation, mass times uh, acceleration. This is the total force. And uh, particles are in a viscous medium, so there is a friction associated with that. That is the first term. Second term is the force arising from the interaction of these particles with all the other particles in the system. So that is the interaction. And then in addition to that, we have this active force which uh, acts in a direction which is given by this unit vector. Its magnitude is equal to f, which is kept constant. Yeah, but this direction can change. And uh, the direction itself obeys uh, basically rotational diffusion. And there is a time scale, tau p, associated with changes in the direction of the active force. So these are the parameters, active parameters. One is this strength. The other is this tau p. It tells us about uh, how long uh, the active force maintains its direction. And then there are, of course, other things that are going into here. I mean, you know, you have to specify that uh, total density of the particles, uh, the parameters in the interaction, and so on and so forth. So that basically specifies the model that uh, we have looked at. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this was done, I mean, this is something that uh, is not very new. It was done uh, in 2020, and uh, we got a phase diagram. The phase diagram, uh, one of the axes is, equal, is this uh, persistence time. The other axis is the uh, strength uh, of the active force. And one gets various phases in this phase diagram. Uh, high active force uh, basically thermal, uh, liquefies the system, uh, fluidizes the system, so we get a liquid. Whereas at low active force, uh, uh, we'll get into some kind of a glass or dynamical arrest. Uh, and uh, then there are intermittent force uh, phases and, and so on and so forth, which uh, uh, I don't have time to get into today. Uh, I've given talks on that in other uh, context. But uh, what I'm going to do today is basically concentrate on this end of this phase diagram, which is extremely persistent limit. So the persistence time here, uh, I mean, in, at least in the model sense, has gone to infinity. And uh, in that limit, what I do is I change my active force and try to find out what kind of different phases one gets and what kind of behavior um, one expects in that particular limit. So that limit is a little, uh, uh, I mean, you know, wants to sort of uh, think a little bit about what we are, one is doing here. So when the persistence time has gone to infinity, it basically means that the active forces that are acting on uh, the various particles uh, 
they are in different directions, but once a direction has been chosen, that direction does not change further in time. So in all these uh, pictures that I had here, these were the directions of the active force. So we choose these directions once and for all. I mean, these directions are at random. Different particles have active forces uh, in different directions. But for a particular particle, this direction, uh, once it is chosen, it doesn't change further as a function of time. So <coughs> that is the system that we are looking at. And a uh, you know, certain number of particles in a given volume or a given area uh, that's uh, specified by the model. So just uh, look at this part of the phase diagram. Uh, <coughs> this is also studied in this, in this paper, but not in great detail. So what, this pap uh, what we found here is that there, uh, as we are changing the active force, the large value of the active force, the system is in a, in a, in a fluid state. Uh, fluid due to activity. There is no thermal fluctuation. You have to remember that it's a thermal system, no thermal fluctuation, but just because of the activity, uh, that uh, can freelize uh, the system if the active force is sufficiently large. But then as one is going down, there is some kind of a uh, characteristic value of this active force such that below that value, system gets into some kind of a jammed state. So this is a jamming transition that I'll be interested in. That uh, in the limit when the persistence time has become very large, uh, as a function of the strength of the active force, one goes from a fluid state to a jammed state as one changes, uh, as one goes to smaller and smaller values of this active force. So just some, exam, uh, some evidence that that is what is going on. So again, you know, uh, we are in, 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 in here, we are <coughs> just uh, looking at different values of this F. When F is large, then one is in a liquid state. And if I look at the kinetic energy, instantaneous kinetic energy as a function of time, then that, of course, uh, fluctuates. This is what you would expect in a, in a liquid, that your kinetic energy will uh, uh, fluctuate about some mean value. So we have a liquid state. Uh, still smaller value of f, we are still in the liquid state. But if f becomes smaller than some characteristic value, which is uh, indicated by this point here, then the kinetic energy essentially goes to zero. System has got stuck into a configuration where uh, each particle basically has no net force. It's a it's force balance uh, uh, configuration taken into account the active force. And once the system get, gets into a state like that, of course, I mean, it doesn't, uh, that's a sink. It doesn't change uh, further as a function of time because no particle is moving. So as a function of F, one goes from uh, this fluctuating liquid state to a stuck jammed uh, state as one decreases the value of F. <coughs> There are other uh, signatures of that. I mean, just one, uh, this is the same thing as I just told you about. If I look at the average kinetic energy, it becomes zero when F is less than this uh, particular value, characteristic value, and then it increases. This is the liquid part, and this is the jammed part. <coughs> so what we have done uh, more recently is to look at this kind of a jamming uh, transition uh, in more detail. And in particular, we have looked at both the liquid state and uh, the reason that I want to say something about the liquid state is that this liquid turns out to be very different from a thermal liquid. And uh, then we also talk about the jamming process as well as the uh, properties of the jammed state. So let me see how much of that we can get into. <coughs> so first look at the properties of the liquid state. So again, in the phase diagram, uh, if I'm at three, the system is in a liquid state. And uh, the, the system is in a liquid state because of this uh, presence of this uh, active forces. <coughs> so we have looked at various properties of this liquid state. And uh, to get the structure of the liquid, one typically looks at this radial distribution function. And uh, again, you know, without going into too many details, I'd like to, we have, what we have found is that Number one, the structure is very similar to that of a thermal liquid, because this system that uh, we are looking at, in the absence of any active force, has been studied quite, quite uh, by several people, and uh, results exist for this uh, radial distribution function. And what we found for the active liquid are uh, very similar. And also, there are uh, uh, <coughs> different system sizes. And this uh, structural property doesn't show any strong dependence on system size. Different systems uh, basically show the same uh, uh, radial distribution function. 
but that is not true for other properties. Uh, and this is something that we found, uh, you know, we are very uh, surprised to see this, that if I look at the kinetic energy per particle in this liquid state and look at its distribution, because, you know, the system is fluctuating, so uh, the kinetic energy per particle is not the same at every instant of time. Uh, at different times, it will have different values, and one looks at the distribution of, this, of these values. Uh, then this distribution, uh, first of all, uh, moves to this way, move to higher values of this kinetic energy as one goes to bigger systems. And also, the width of the distribution does not narrow. It sort of remains more or less constant or actually a little bit increases. So if you, if you uh, remember your sort of equilibrium thermodynamics, this is not expected in a thermal liquid. If we look at the kinetic energy per particle, then that is given by uh, in two dimensions uh, uh, KBT. And uh, the distribution should get sharper and sharper as one goes to bigger and bigger systems, because fluctuations will be less. Uh, relative fluctuations will be less as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. So here, uh, the peak value is shifting as well as the distribution uh, width uh, is also uh, actually uh, not becoming smaller as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. Uh, the same thing goes for the distribution of the potential energy. So the system size dependence persists for very large, till very large values of the, the of system size. And uh, to understand what is going on, uh, there's uh, it, the, the structural properties that I showed last time, uh, in the last uh, slide, doesn't show any system size dependence, which is as strong as this. So one has to look for some uh, different origin. It's not a structural origin, but, uh, uh, and one thing that we found, which actually uh, gives you uh, a strong uh, system size dependence, will lead to a strong system size dependence, is the correlation function, which is the velocity uh, correlation function. So <coughs> in this liquid state, one looks at the velocity of a particle and the velocity of some other particle and how they are correlated, uh, the fixed time. Uh, and this correlation will depend on the distance between the two points. So it's the uh, spatial correlation function of the velocity field in the liquid state. And you can see that this correlation function uh, falls off very, very slowly as a function of distance. And not just that, that as one goes to bigger and bigger systems, uh, this correlation function falls off more and more slowly. So if one, defines, if one defines a length scale associated with this uh, decay of the correlation function, that length scale will continue to increase as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. And uh, you know that you know, if you have a uh, length scale which is comparable to your system size, then one expects a strong system size dependence in some of the quantities. And uh, we believe that the system size dependence that we see here is related to the presence of this correlation length, which is becoming bigger and bigger as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. So this liquid is very different from a thermal liquid in this sense. So the velocities are correlated over large length scales, and uh, th that one doesn't see in a thermal system. And uh, although we have a liquid whose structure looks similar to that of a thermal liquid, the velocity correlations are very different from what you have in a thermal liquid. <coughs> and uh, one can look at uh, how this correlation length uh, depends on the system size, and it keeps on increasing as we increase the system size. So uh, normally, I mean, if you're looking at critical phenomena and things like that, you would interpret this as saying that uh, the correlation length actually is a diverging correlation length. And then, you know, if a finite size system, uh, of course, nothing is divergent, so the correlation length will be set by the system size. So basically, here the correlation length is proportional to square root of the number of particles, uh, two dimensions. Square root of the number of particles is basically the system size. And so it just suggests that in this uh, sort of persistent uh, active liquid, there is a, a diverging correlation length uh, associated with uh, spatial correlations of the velocity field. <coughs> so this is one thing that is very different from uh, thermal liquids. <coughs> uh, since yeah, so I uh, am showing you one picture here. Uh, which uh, supposedly shows, I mean, you know, this is something that we are investigating more in detail, but this is the velocity field. Uh, and, you know, there is a, a bar here which says the slighter regions are where the velocity is large. And you can see that uh, these regions are connected, and if I now want to look at the direction of the velocity, 
we'll see this what is known as a swirling motion. A large a group of particles are moving together. And uh, this shows up in uh, large coalition length associated with the uh, special coalition function of the velocity. <coughs> so this is uh, hmm, the properties of the liquid state. And this uh, movie that I have is basically now uh, the jamming process. We start with this liquid for large value of f, and it quench it down to a small value of f, uh, for which it is supposed to be jammed. And uh, what one is showing here is basically, uh, let me just finish it, and uh, here. So, so starting. <coughs> Why is it not playing? Huh. System is basically, so this uh, blue is basically, but the velocity is very close to zero. So just uh, play a little attention, then you will see that it basically gets stuck into a state, but then suddenly you know, some disturbance happens, and uh, the velocities become uh, non-zero. And then eventually, of course, I mean, it will reach a jammed state, but all the velocities are equal to zero. So all I'm trying to show in this is that uh, the process of uh, getting jammed is highly intermittent, in the sense that initially things change quite quickly. Uh, then the system sort of gets stuck into uh, a nearly jammed state. And then some disturbance happens. And here it is more or less stuck, but then again, some disturbance happens. And so it sort of goes back and forth between this nearly jammed state, and then there is some disturbance which takes it away from this jammed state. Eventually, it gets stuck into a uh, truly jammed state. So this intermittency is important. Uh, <coughs> this is the process of uh, getting jammed. So I mean, looking at the kinetic energy as a function of time after this quench. So initially, they start with some initial value, and then uh, eventually decreases and eventually goes to zero as the system gets jammed. But uh, for different values of this active force, the time scale associated with this is very uh, different. So here, one is looking at uh, f equals 0 uh, system. I mean, if I just take the uh, liquid and then quench it down to f equals 0, then it jams pretty quickly. But as one increases f, this process becomes more and more time consuming. And in particular, this plateau develops. And so initially, the kinetic energy decreases, but then reaches some kind of a plateau. And then eventually, from that plateau, there is a, an exponential uh, decay. So the time scale is increasing as one is going to larger and larger values of f. The question is, how does it increase? And uh, <coughs> again, you know, there's some work is still going on. And we don't have uh, you know, very, uh, a lot of data on this yet. But uh, what it suggests is that this is the time scale as a function of uh, the, uh, the f, the, the strength of the uh, active force. And initial uh, growth seems to indicate that it would divert. I mean, that was basically the conclusion of our original study, when we thought that there is a critical value, and uh, this time scale to jam would divert as f becomes bigger than this critical value. Then it will not jam, uh, it will not jam at all. But here, uh, it says that if I go to even larger values of f, uh, this apparent divergence that does not take place, and uh, the growth is much slower. So this uh, existence of a critical force for jamming that uh, uh, is unclear in the sense that you know uh, initially from uh, this part of the picture, if we had sort of uh, fitted this and claimed that there would be a divergence at some value of f, then it would say that you know, for values of f larger than that value, the system would not jam at all because the time goes to infinity. But uh, whether that actually happens or not, that remains to be said. So I should finish by 4 o'clock or start it a little late? Yeah, hmm? yeah, five, five, five more minutes. <coughs> passive is when, uh, passive is this. Yes. No. No, no. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm changing the uh, active force. The different points here correspond to different values of the active force. How the time to jam. So this is basically this picture, the previous picture. Battery is running low. 
this picture. As I increase f, system is taking longer and longer time to jam. Right? Passive system is this one, when f is equal to 0. So here, there is hardly any difference. Hmm. Yeah, this is just local uh, relaxation, yes. Yeah, so that is the next picture where uh, looking at this time scale uh, and it increases quite rapidly initially. This time scale is the time to jam. So the time scale is going from here to there. The total time scale. And as you can see here, as one goes to larger values of f, this whole thing gets postponed and one has to go to much larger time to see jamming. And that is what is being plotted here. So initially, it increases as if it would diverge, but uh, this divergence doesn't happen, it seems. that it, it changes from some kind of a, a power law divergence to some kind of uh, uh, an exponential dependence, which doesn't diverge. So <coughs> more work is needed to find out whether there is actually a critical force for them. Something like that, yes. I mean, you know, in glass transition also, sometimes uh, one fits it with vogel fulcher or something like that, which would diverge, or a power law, which would diverge. But then as one goes to still uh, lower temperatures, uh, then uh, one sees deviations from that. So uh, this divergence, uh, apparent divergence, uh, uh, doesn't actually take place. Uh, so that is, uh, of course, the obvious question. So here we are also looking at system size dependence of this time. So this is for a fixed system size as we are changing f. And here we are looking at uh, this time as a function of system size for a fixed f. OK, so there is a strong dependence on system size, but it's still a power law. So as you go to bigger and bigger system sizes, this time will increase. But it will diverge only in the limit where the system size itself goes to infinity. So any finite system, it seems that the time scale remains finite. So whether there is a jamming point or not, that uh, I mean, at least this data would suggest there is no critical value of this jamming. In the sense that uh, for any value of uh, this, this, uh, this uh, active force F, system will eventually get jammed. The time will increase as we go to bigger and bigger f. Time will increase as you go to bigger and bigger n. But none of these dependencies seem to show any diverging behavior. So this is the process of jamming. And then the last thing that uh, in two minutes I just want to point out that uh, we also looked at the properties of the active jam state. The state uh, I mean for a finite system, it gets jammed. So one can study the property of that uh, jam state and uh, see whether they are similar to or different from the properties that you have for passive uh, uh, jam system. <coughs> and there, uh, without going into too many details, uh, <coughs> I want to show this picture. So earlier I told you that in a passive jam state, when one is near the threshold, then this distribution of this active fo contact force shows a power law dependence. This is, we also see this power law dependence uh, for the passive system that uh, three or four decades, one has a very nice power law, the distribution of this uh, contact force. But for uh, uh, this actively jammed state, uh, this power law works for some region, but then as one comes to smaller values of f, one sees deviations from this power law. And this deviation uh, depend on what is the value of this active force. So now uh, one can try to see whether these deviations follow some kind of a scaling behavior, and we do indeed find uh, scaling behavior. That the deviation, of course, uh, the point where this deviation occurs that depends on what is the value of f, and that uh, is governed by some exponent and, and so on and so forth. So we can scale the whole data for different values of f. That is what we show here. But this scaling function uh, seems to have a gap. That this scaling function uh, doesn't have any weight for uh, small values of this of this of this contact force. Whereas uh, in a uh, passive jam system, this power law is uh, supposed to work for all the way down to f equals 0. So the jam state that we get here also appears to be somewhat different 
from the jam state that you have in passive system. And uh, that is basically the message. Uh, <coughs> this is the summary. So in the liquid state, we see these long range velocity correlations, which are certainly not there in a thermal or passive liquid. Uh, <coughs> then uh, as we quench this uh, liquid into uh, for to a value of f, which is small, then one sees jamming for finite systems. But as one goes to bigger and bigger system sizes or longer and longer times, whether this jamming, uh, uh, whether there is a value of f for which uh, the jamming time goes to infinity. That, that remains uh, unclear. And um, the evidence is that uh, uh, the jamming time remains finite for all finite f as well as for all finite n. Only in the n going to infinity limit or in the f going to infinity limit, the jamming time will diverge. Uh, <coughs> the jamming process, as we showed, uh, has a, a strong intermittent behavior that the system seems to get stuck and then revives itself and then again gets stuck and so on and so forth which has been seen in uh, uh, our simulations as well as in uh, some experiments, uh, which Rajesh may talk about. Mm, when, the, when, the, uh, when the persistence time is large, but not infinity. Uh, contact force distribution uh, exhibits scaling, but the scaling function seems to have a gap. So this uh, state, uh, damp state, is not a marginal state, according to uh, our, our results. So it just says that uh, uh, the states that we see, the liquid state, jam state, as well as the process of jamming, uh, is, is qualitatively different from their passive counterparts and uh, sort of a new kind of non-equilibrium phenomena that we are seeing in this system. So that's where I stop. Uh, I may have taken a little longer than uh, allotted. So sorry about that. Mm -hmm. There is a tail which is uh, not And it becomes more Gaussian it, yeah. as you increase system size. So is that something that is? Uh, yeah, so we have looked at uh, uh, quantities like you know the, the fourth moment and things like that, which uh, tests whether to what extent a Gaussian description is good. Uh, that uh, this, this tail that you have for large values of uh, the, the kinetic energy, that uh, seems to be present in all uh, system sizes. Oh. Uh, and uh, we don't see any, any sign of that going away. Um, and the second thing is, if you look at the literature on these uh, biological systems, uh, glassiness and jamming is used interchangeably without making a distinction mm -hmm. about whether one should call it a glassy phase or. Yes. So what is the final say? That what would you? No, no I would like to make a distinction in the sense that I would say that this jamming uh, jam state uh, is, is one in which uh, uh, there is force balance, each particle. And it's a sink of the dynamics. That once on, uh, there is no thermal noise. And here we look at the active force, which itself doesn't have any dynamics. So in this system, one can get a truly jam state. But if the active force has some dynamics, or you have some thermal fluctuations, then even in a stuck state, there will be dynamics at small scales. So that I'll call a glass or kinetically arrayed state, where the kinetic energy strictly is not equal to zero. But uh, in this case, uh, when the persistence time goes to infinity, where the uh, forces don't have any dynamics, as well as we have put the thermal fluctuations to be equal to zero, there the system gets into a force balance state, then it will remain there forever. So that's true jamming, in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks. Um, wh what's the importance of boundary conditions Mm -hmm. in your simulations yeah. on, on these results. So uh, this would imply that the boundary conditions will have a strong effect. In, here, of course, I mean, in your numerical work, you always use periodic boundary conditions. But uh, real systems will have some boundaries. And uh, people have found in earlier experiments also, in active systems, the effects of boundaries is, uh, are more pronounced, in the sense that uh, if, if you change the if you change the uh, the boundaries, so if you have uh, hard boundaries instead mm -hmm. of periodic boundaries, so there, uh, yeah, I mean you know, there are simulations, also experiments, where these active particles uh, seem to aggregate near the boundaries, uh, and uh, you know which doesn't happen no, under, under normal circumstances in a in a, in a thermal liquid, uh, <coughs> and uh, there are evidence that the effect of the boundary condition will persist deep inside the bulk. Uh, may not be all the way to the bulk, but uh, it persists to a longer distance 
as compared to what you would have in a simple thermal liquid. So uh, this correlation function, of course, I mean, you know, it's, it's a special limit that we have looked at where uh, we have infinite persistence time. But uh, in a large but finite persistence time, perhaps this length scale will not continue to grow uh, as you go to bigger and bigger systems, but it will be a large length scale. So uh, that will mean that the effect of boundary conditions will become more important. Another uh, hopefully quick question. What, what would mm -hmm. be the effect of, uh, say, anisotropy of the, 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 these particles? If instead of having, you have point particles, mm -hmm. I, I presume, what if you have, say, we have done some work earlier on uh, uh, dumbbells. Uh, so there, there is a, uh, of course, obvious thing is that there is also the possibility of uh, uh, orientational glass. I mean, here we are talking about uh, the, the distribution of the particles and uh, whether there is any order in that or not. One can also talk about uh, the orientations of these dumbbells and whether they get frozen without uh, getting into an ordered state. So that is there. And uh, we also found that uh, this kind of swirling motion mm, that also becomes more pronounced when you have uh, anisotropic particles. Thank yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, what is the ro uh, does the initial condition influence the outcome? Uh, for example, in this case, you had these vectors like randomly oriented. Mm -hmm. If you have lanes. Uh, one lane of a uh, particle like you know, moving in one direction, the other lane of particle moving in the other direction. So does yes, that we have not looked at, looked at that. Okay. But one thing that we made sure is that mm, these forces are up to zero. Okay. So I mean, when we choose the initial directions of the forces, we chose them in such a way that uh, they are up to zero so that there is no center of mass motion. Fine. But one can also uh, have situations where that condition is correct, but you know, there is some pattern in the directions of the forces. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting uh, possibility which we have not looked at. Okay. Uh, the other question that I had was like, you know, if I think of cells and if I uh, think, uh, think of cells uh, like, you know, in liquid, and if I want to model them, I would use a O damped equation. O damped, yes. Yeah. So here uh, it was a different model. Huh. So O'dam. here uh, actually uh, depends on which, which, which uh, simulation we're talking about. Uh, uh, the, the simulations that were published in that uh, nature communications paper, we looked at a mass term, uh, inertial term. Okay. But we also checked that uh, if we drop that inertial term, if we look at overdumped dynamics, then uh, the qualitative behavior does not change. Okay. Yeah. And nowadays there is some, uh, there are some examples of active uh, systems where actually the inertial term is important. So that's a general case, and uh, uh, in this case. Uh, for these parameters, uh, overdumped gives you essentially the same thing. Okay, yeah, thanks. Hello, Professor. Hello. Yeah. Uh, just one quick question. So these are athermal systems, right? Mm -hmm. So what brings in the disturbance in the system so that we are observing the transient jamming state? So what leads to the disturbance? It is the uh, system the itself, in the sense that you know there are these forces which are acting on this particle. In addition to the interparticle forces, you have also this active force, right? If I look at a particular particle, then it sees a force coming from all its neighbors through interactions. As the neighbors change, then that force changes. So once in the jam state, the neighbors are fixed, right? Huh. So if it go, goes into a truly jam state, then it, it cannot change as a function of time. A truly jam state is where the net force on each particle is equal to zero. But if one can go to a state where the uh, net force is not zero, but you know, uh, ten to the minus uh, five or whatever for some of the particles, and those particles initially will move very very slowly, but uh, then their motion will again uh, get amplified when it, they begin to affect the other particles. Thank you. People uh, have tried to develop uh, uh, hydrodynamic theories of this this kind of phenomena, where uh, uh, so there are various concepts that one can bring into the picture. Uh, in certain limits, the effect of this uh, activity can be represented by some kind of a effective temperature, for example. I mean, here we see that the activity is large, system goes into a liquid state. There's no thermal fluctuation. It's only because of the activity. So this activity, in some sense, uh, in, in an approximate sense, acts like some kind of a temperature. So then, you know, one can, one can bring in uh, some analogies with uh, what happens in the usual hydrodynamics. 
uh, <coughs> one can also start with the hydrodynamics of a fluid, then add terms to it, which would not be allowed in a, in a, in a thermal fluid, in an equilibrium fluid, but which would mimic the effects of activity. So you modify the hydrodynamic equations to take into account this kind of forces. So that's also another uh, line of, 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 of investigation. So the continuum description is, is possible. Any questions, uh, especially from the students? So uh, with regard to this uh, jamming that happens, if you do the equivalent of a ISO configurational ensemble, but you randomize the forces, mm -hmm. orientations, but you keep the structure the same, would you get the same trajectory of evolution in the intermittent jamming? And jamming? You start with yeah. the same. So I mean, uh, what you're saying is that, let's say I start with the same liquid state. Same liquid state, with same uh, particle positions. Same particle positions, but, but the force vectors are all yes. uh, of a different uh, orientation. Yeah. So then the runs will be very, very different from each other. Uh, but the qualitative jamming, uh, the, 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 the yeah, jamming, so that should, the intermittent character should persist. That will persist, but one thing that changes very drastically is the time to jam. Uh, for some choices of uh, initial conditions and the initialization of the, of the directions of the forces, uh, uh, system can jam quickly. And some other configuration, it may go on for a long time. So I mean, that's why a lot of averaging is necessary to get something which is smooth. Uh, so things do depend on the particular realization of the, of the active forces. I'm sorry, you're keeping people